Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 64 of the Runter Hills podcast, sponsored by Chia Charge. This week, I talked to Mandy Foister about her recent Tunnel Ultra finish, Sheep, Norfolk Trail Runners, and a few other bits and bobs too. But first, Eddie, over to you. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Not too bad. Still here, still living. First week of taper. I think the first week of taper is worse than the second week of taper. Yeah. But because you're just such a long way out. It feels a bit <laughs> endless and you're still doing a bit of running and there's all, I did like four miles the other morning. I was like, I can't, I can't run four miles. Oh my God, this is so long. <laughs> oh my life. And then you, then I start, do you ever do this? I start working out. So if I do that, oh my God, I'll do that like 30 times. I'll do that yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. I can't do that. 30 do times. the maths. But uh, I've sort of got through the this week, a few sessions, a few little waiting <laughs> I'm waiting to feel good sessions. I've just done my last, um, I, d- I had an uphill session to do and a like fattish session to do. Yeah. And I was like, come on legs, come on now. Is this when they feel good? Is this when they feel good? <laughs> but um, I've started to feel less like in the morning, I can get out of bed and just be like, yeah. and I ran the other day, yesterday to the car and I was like, oh my God, my legs feel, oh my God, they don't feel sore. They don't oh, feel that's sore. That's awesome. Sore. Freshness is coming. Yeah. It's coming. It's just taking its time. And I just feel so sick at the thought of it. I feel so nervous. I'm sure it's worse, worse this week than next week because next week it's going to be like, I think of it like a magician's box when you when they do that trick with their glamorous assistants. A bit like me to you, Gary. I'm your like glamorous assistant. Yeah. And Debbie, I'm your Debbie McGee. <laughs> and they get in the box and they slowly like <laughs> shut it down. They shut all the lids down. So next week I can start to do that and slowly, you know, everything's sorted. The kit's sorted, the yeah. food sorted, you know, the kids get sorted. Everything gets shut down till all I have to do is think about the race. But yeah. at the moment, there's still a lot of a life to be lived when really yeah. I just want to be like sitting watching Netflix and not thinking. And I just keep thinking, I'm trying to get myself out of the headspace, but I know it's all part of the process of nervous the nervous anxiety i can't yeah. do it i can't do it so far how do i but the minute i start um it will all be fine i know oh. i can do it i know you've I can got do a it. bit of um sisu ready that's all i'll say go and google that go oh okay i will <laughs> i like that when you reduce all the noise yes. and eventually all i struggle i got fit you know like many people you're spinning 50 plates but eventually you have to focus on yeah the yeah. job at hand and it's nice just to and I think the taper does that as well like as you come out of the training fug my last this morning so I was doing progressive 2k's and my last k I was like I felt it I felt the fire within and I felt strong and I felt like yeah I've, I if I need when when not if when I need to go to that place of deep pain and suffering yeah. and I just need to be there I'm ready to go in there. Whereas like last week when I was still quite tired, I was like, oh no, no, I can't. <laughs> it's too much. Whereas now I'm starting through the taper, you start to feel like mentally fresher as well. You're yeah. like, yeah, let me at them. A bit more time on your hands, a bit more, yeah, a bit fresher. I think a bit it's more time. And I'm trying to get everything sorted so that the week after when I am truly useless um i'm not then trying to do <laughs> stuff as well so that everybody's you know i'm not i'm not booking any i'm trying to just get everything squared away so yeah i can to next week tunnel focus and be there so that was a long way around of saying yeah i'm just tapering so it's not <laughs> <laughs> that was good and like you say you know you, you're preparing the the admin after the event. This is all kind of real life, um, real life stuff that people have got to juggle lots of things. Yeah, my husband very. He said I've booked Monday off work. I was like, <laughs> you don't need to do that. He's like, I think I do. I was like, oh yeah, that would be kind because even the school run for those that know that have done a massive race and then the next like just getting in and out of the car and the stairs <laughs> and everything takes so long. So it's that was very kind of him. And it's all those little things that when you're doing the race as well, when I'm like, he's taking the day off work. Come on, put the effort in. Come on. It's all those little things that I like to use to like keep those little legs turning. I think I might be wrong. I might be remembering this wrong, but I'm sure that um Sarah Perry went to work after her win, right? Yes, 
course to course because Lee, I think Luke had a day off and was feeling exhausted. I could be getting my facts muddled. Well, she up has to go to work. I mean, a teacher, you can't book a day off as a teacher. Next generation, yeah. You can't. Yeah. You've got to go in. I'm pretty <laughs> sure those kids might have done a lot of quiet colouring. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's YouTube the answer to this because it's not just the f- the physical tiredness; it's, it's the mental complete like inability oh, wow. to um anyway anything. i love all that i love all that anyway so yeah i'm just trying to re- <clears throat> taper with and deal with the nervous anxiety and every time i hear that ding 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 the little monkey in the boxing ring going you can't do it you can't do it i'm just slapping him down yeah yeah or well, like i say google sisu finish okay. it's a finish phrase i love you and you finish it. how are you feeling my little <laughs> <laughs> a little snivelly northerner. <laughs> I did just say to Gary, we've had about four Zoom calls while you've been COVID and post-COVID, and every one I see you, you look a little bit better, bit which better. only shows the one when we did when you were deep in COVID. You looked so ill. <laughs> I didn't think I looked too bad, but obviously I did. No, you, do, you just look a little, yeah, there's a little bit more colour. Well, you were, quite a, you were quite a colour when you were really ill, but it was kind of like a sort of red. It's all this studio lighting I've got, Eddie. You know, it's, of it's... course, it's the producer with his <laughs> lightning light shining on you. But I have to say on a, <clears throat> yeah, I'll feel loads better, to be honest. Um, I didn't do any, I 100% no running for 10, well, I can't remember actually how long I had to isolate for, but... It was definitely two weekends, um, 100% no running. Uh, and I did feel pretty rubbish all week. I, but what was a positive, I managed to do, I've been kind of struggling to do all my strength and conditioning for weeks and weeks and weeks. I always kind of did two, I think, I maxed out on two. Um, but I did all three. I may have even done four of my exercises. So I overdid it there. And I, it was tough. It was quite hard doing my sit-ups, my press-ups and my uh, lunges and stuff like that. It was pretty hard work. Um, sometimes when I do my press-ups, I put a little back-weighted backpack on and they're inverted press-ups and I'll I'll sometimes do two rounds of that uh, and I do the second round to, to failure and I couldn't even face doing the second. Like, it'll be, say, three sets of ten, but the second batch, it, it gets quite tiring. Um but yeah, I couldn't even do the second batch. I couldn't. <laughs> so I just yeah. did that. But but yeah, it was fine. And um, but what I did do, you know, I mentioned before I'm quite a comfort eater. So I I did quite well, I think, during the partly partly through the week, and then we watched the bake off, and that was it. My sugar, my sugar tooth, sweet tooth had been satisfied and um <laughs> kind of smashed the smashed the cupboard door down and went through the street waffles. <laughs> Which uh, tasted nice, but... Um, what did you call yourself? A light layer of Stroop waffle was yeah, now but... covering your <laughs> I don't even know what Stroop waffles are. They sound oh delicious. Oh, my goodness. They're like a little um, waffle with caramel in the middle. And they're, they're really, really a Dutch uh, treat. And they're, what's that, about, say, 10 centimetres in diameter. And what you do, you get a nice cup of tea, Eddie. Yeah, it okay. Sits over the good. sits over the cu- cup of tea. And it warms up the hot steam, warms the street waffle, and becomes this warm caramel treat. It's absolutely <sighs> sensational. Sounds yeah. dangerous. We had a friend, one of friend, Lisa's friends went down. Can Holland. I use a baguette? Is it the same? No. It's not. no. <laughs> No, just lots of sugar, basically. <laughs> that's uh, that's it. But yeah, they came. They were actually uh, authentic Dutch street waffles. So oh, I bet they were good. Yeah, super yummy. And anything else? Um, so you've gone back to running now, post COVID, because people might be quite interested to hear yeah. how you're feeling and how you're managing that. Because I was quite strict with you, wasn't I, on WhatsApp saying? I get told off quite a few times. <laughs> Tips from I think that's all my WhatsApp is, is telling <laughs> various people off. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I have to say, because we're recording quite late in the week, it's Thursday, so I ran Tuesday, I think I was allowed out Tuesday, <clears throat> more modelled up really, and basically I can run, it's not too bad to run. Um, good to hear, otherwise but, this would be... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but the effort, um, if I try, I did some strides yesterday and immediately felt it, and I'm just achy. Um, and it's not like a, if you've got a flu kind of deep joint ache. It's not that. I mean, just my legs feel achy. And I initially thought it was some kind of delayed onset muscle soreness, dumbs. Um, and it's not bad because it's not going away. And it's just this, yeah, it's quite hard to explain. Really. It's just a, a low, gra- low um, 
kind of grid ache on my, on my, on my legs. Uh, so tonight was supposed to be a workout, um, which I'm not going to do. It's going to be 10 minutes hard and then six times a K. I'm going to push that back until tomorrow and see how I feel. But just to run tonight with some friends and that will be a bit faster than what I'm used to. So we'll just see how that goes. Um, but yeah, I can't, you know, I can't complain. I'm, I'm obviously quite anxious because of Valencia coming up, but if I had no event, I'd be quite happy with just doing what I can do. Um, and yeah, just re reassessing Valencia goals. Uh, it's quite funny. Justin sent me a text. He, he's, he's moved himself down a pen. So he's starting with me in the, um, he was like in the 245. I love pen. a positive start. I'm going straight, no, I'm going straight down the pen. No, that's it. Yeah. So he's moved himself down to the same pen as me to start in, but then he texted me or mess messaged me last night saying that he went for a marathon paced half marathon and he's way off. So I think he's just clinging to a sub three. That's his, that's his just quick. Yeah. I saw that it's size. I hate saying stuff like that, but his goals have been re uh, addressed to sub three. And the same for me too, really. There's no aspirations, but I would love to achieve good for age for London again. That would be wicked. And that would be 2023 London. So that's how far in advance I have another chance again with London Marathon in 2022. But that is the last day to get the good for age time. So if I can, I don't plan on doing any fast road marathons because of the Lake and 100. I don't yeah. know. So it'd be awesome if I could do it with Lentia, but then I've got another chance, London 2022. So oh, yeah, Okay. I, okay. Sort of... To get, to, I, I get it. What's, what, what do you have to get? Is it a three hour? It's 310. The, the time oh, is, I that. Well, you've got, <laughs> but you've got to be, I you want to be as far, as far away from that as possible. I think, to, yeah. I think five minutes under should do it. Um, but I'll find out actually we get our London marathon good for age thumbs up or thumbs down that comes that's going to come around I think early December so I should know I would say 259 this year and is it April again next year or is it October, no, no, it's again, October again yeah so I thought it was I, I do have another chance next year but I, like I say I'll have Lake 100 oh, this is a problem because Lake 100 is end of July so I probably won't do much August and then you've got September to That's train. That's fine, because I, I reckon if you've got that 100 endurance in your legs and you have a proper rest in August, yeah. and you give yourself a six-week kick up the butt, yeah, um, it might not be, you know, super fast, but I, I reckon you can build on a lot of that fitness. You can almost yeah. miss six weeks of your marathon plan because it will still be there. And as long as I think that's more about just managing your... Uh, you come back. You come back, yeah. I'll, you know, it's good to have a, a second chance, but I would yeah. love to have done it in, in Valencia if possible. So that's my only goal, but it's out of your hands. You know, literally you set off and I'm not going to take COVID lightly. If it's if I'm really struggling, then it's you just slow down. I, fundamentally, you see, you know, you kind of, uh, it stuck with me when you said about enjoying the lake, end of the Lake 100. And I, and I ultimately want to enjoy Valencia. So if it's really feeling hard, I'm going to slow down and enjoy it. I'm not going to rinse myself. It's as, it's as simple as that. And so, yeah. And if you feel crap and it's not COVID, you can just blame COVID and just go, oh, well, yeah, yeah it was really bad. So I, uh, <laughs> I really slowed down. And we'll go, oh, you're so sensible, Gary. You'll be like, I just don't really? fancy well, I've had these thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> we all have those thoughts. He's got the bank of excuses ready, <laughs> one side of our note. But I do need to be, you know, this is also something I'm thinking about. Is it me just being shit? Or is it actually COVID? You know, am I just feeling a bit sorry for myself, a bit coldy, or is it this lingering effect of COVID? I need to try and. Uh... Well, you every time, you know, like I said, we spoke and you felt better and better. So just let it organically, you know. Just next week you'll feel even different, and just let it pass. Sunny San Miguel's in Valencia. Just yeah, focus on that. Don't. I would just take the stress away from it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Stress is no good, right? People have been racing, not just tapering and talking about racing. Beacons Ultra, Mark Derbyshire. What a year Mark's had. Mark's had, yeah. He, uh, Lakeland 100, didn't finish UTMB, but come back by Beacons Ultra. I wonder if he's chasing some points there for something. Oh, yes. 609, that's fast. And Claudia Chimilowska, I wonder if that's Polish. Yes, I think it is. Yeah, I think it's Seven Polish. hours, 43. It's a good race. I've, I've talked about that. We've talked about that one before to collect some CCC points um, or as a 
uh, first ultra challenge. Then we go over to the Punk Panthers short circuit out of Otley. I think that's a name change for next year. I, I, I struggled to find the results. So I think this year it was called the short circuit, but next year it's called something else. Um, so yeah, George Ravenhall took the win in five hours, 12. And Jay McCarthy took the win for the ladies in five hours, 48 minutes. So well done, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure what they're going to be called next year, but it looked like great. They're really good, the Punk Panther look. They get lots of good images, social media. So it's nice to see lots of smiles out on the trails. Uh, and in down south, on the Druid's Way, a uh, three-day uh, multi-stage race, um, 86 miles, about 20,000 20, feet. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> starting um, East England and running along all the way on the Druid's Way, east to west. Uh, uh, we had uh, Rob Hill winning, and then we had brothers, Nathan and Justin Montague, uh, in second and third place. Love those two. Two steaming fast guys and two of the nicest guys that you'll meet. And then in the women's field, Sarah Hill uh, took first place, and then Melissa Montague, wife, um, <laughs> wife of Mont the Montague. So it's such a good name, isn't it? Yeah. Sound like some sort of gent family... Uh, uh, what is it? Family from Bride and Prejudice, the Montagues. <laughs> Liz Montague's second, and Jenny Hartley was third. And again, another great run by XRNG um, that do loads of multi days all over the south of England. So if you're getting into multi days or you want a new challenge or you're thinking maybe Dragon's Back or Cape Wrath is in your future, they are a great company to go and have a go at um, running multi days, sorting kit, sorting admin experiencing that multi-day day after day of running so great to see them back up and running after covid for this week's interview i have a chat with mandy foister and what a lovely person mandy is eddie um i really enjoyed our chats and i did i found a super duper and really inspirational too i hope you enjoy it <laughs> Hi, today we'd like to welcome Mandy Foister onto the show. Mandy's the first female finisher of the recent Tunnel Ultra, which looks like an epic channel challenge. And I can't wait to hear all about it, Mandy. But first, uh, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Where are you? And have you been for a run today? Oh, hello, Gary. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. It was really nice of you. Uh -huh. uh, I'm in Norfolk, in just north of Norwich, in a little village where we live. And I have been for a very short run today. I only did one and a half miles yeah. um, just to keep my running streak going. Might go out again later. <laughs> oh, run streak. How, how long is the streak? Well, it's not very long, this one. I'm just trying to run every day this year. Okay. And um, I'm sort of um, doing something called Miles from Omo in memory of a sheep. <laughs> I know that's a bit unusual, oh. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I'm involved with a sheep sanctuary and yeah. all my running is sort of connected with um, fundraising for the sheep sanctuary. So awesome. I promise to do at least a mile every day this year for Momo. <laughs> Oh, that's a fantastic challenge. And is there you and other runners or this is just your own challenge? Um, well, myself and um, my friend Andy Bailey from the Sheep Sanctuary, who, yeah. who runs the Sheep Sanctuary, he's also doing miles from Omo. He, he's not doing a running streak. He's just trying to complete as many miles as he can yeah. this Excellent. year. It's just a bit of a fun thing in memory of a very lovely sheep who passed away last year. <laughs> well, we'll talk about, we'll come on to the Sheep Sanctuary later, if that's okay. But if, yeah, first of all, if you could share a bit about your running journey um, so far. Okay, well, well, I, I started running when I was about 17. Yeah. And the, the first event I ever did was um, an event called um, The Race Against Time. Okay. And it was inspired by Bob Geldof's Live Aid concert. Okay. And it was an event... Well, I think it was about 44 consecutive countries all around the world hosted. I can't remember the, the length of the event. I think it was either a 10K or 5K race or something like that. It was probably yeah. in miles then. But but there were literally, you know, millions of people all, all around the world taking oh part goodness. in the race against time. I've still got the T-shirt, actually. Oh. Um, and, I, and I can remember doing that event and just thinking, oh, how happy I felt. What a lovely feeling it was. Yeah. And, and then I... I sort of carried on running as, as a teenager or sort of older teenager and I think you know when you're growing up life's quite tough at times and it always 
um, seemed to sort of help me emotionally yeah. to feel better and to, to cope with the difficulties that life was throwing at me. So at first I didn't really do any races or anything. I was just running simply for, you know, you know, the sheer sort of physical well-being and emotional well-being. Yeah. And then I ran my first London Marathon in 1988. And that was it. Um, I loved distance running. <laughs> I was c completely hooked. Desperately wanted to do the marathon again. As soon after that, I got married and we had children. Yeah. Um, so that sort of, you know, put a stop to being able to do regular long yeah. distance events. But I, I carried on doing the London Marathon whenever I could, whenever I got a place. Yeah. And did a few other events as well, um, shorter ones. Um, but it was a time in my life where family always came first. So, you know, usually I, you know, perhaps only did one event a year. And um, the rest of the time just ran for well-being. Yeah. And then it wasn't really until um, about 2002, 2003, something like that, that I really picked up the running again and I was fortunate to get good for age places in the London Marathon oh, brilliant. for about 10 consecutive years and I, I just really enjoyed you know the challenge every year of um, trying to beat my time or yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just loved the loved the training I lo loved everything about running it just makes me feel great and and then there were some times as well when I was sort of able to introduce our sons to it and you know we did a few runs together I did the oh, Great brilliant. North Run with my yeah. son and um, did the Norwich 10k with another son yeah. and 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 then kind of um I think I got bored of running marathons because <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I always used always used to do all my running for sponsorship for charities yes and I used to go back to people year after year and say oh will you sponsor me I'm running a marathon and I thought well this is silly everyone knows I can run a marathon yeah yeah and it was in 2011 that um, one of them my son sort of rather lightheartedly said to me, why don't you run to London, Mum, and then run the marathon? <laughs> oh, my goodness me. <laughs> and he was only joking. And I kind of like thought, oh, that's a good idea. Good idea, yeah. <laughs> um, and the, the sort of seed was set. So I set about planning my own little personal adventure and ran to London. And I did it quite tamely the first time. I sort of staved off at um, travel lodges and... Um, yeah. friends houses on the way down and ran down over five days and then ran the marathon when I got there oh my goodness and um I was, I was injured with sort of um shin splints and possible stretch stress fracture by the time oh, I finished well, it yeah, so it was yeah. a bit of a painful experience oh, but... it took me to call that one yeah <laughs> yeah and and then after that I sort of you know got the bug really for adventure running and I wasn't um, very computer literate at that time, so I wasn't really aware of all the races that were going on. Yeah. So, so for the next few years, I sort of invented my own adventures and Excellent. and did various things. I, I also did quite a bit of cycling. Yeah. Um, I cycled Land's End to John O'Groats um, and sort of wild camp, slept out yeah. in the fields and hedges overnight. And oh, and I, I sort of did um, a run from St David's Head in Wales across yeah the widest part of the UK to Lowestoft in Norfolk, yeah. again, carrying all my equipment in a backpack and um, sleeping in sort of bus shelters, polytunnels, uh, fields in a barn full of sheep, <laughs> anything really. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and on these sort of, um, sort of solo self-supported adventures, that was where I I sort of discovered my fondness for sheep yeah. because often they were the only company I had on my uh, adventures and I quite often seem to end up sort of sleeping in fields next to sheep yeah. barring <laughs> and so I sort of developed a fondness for sheep on my adventures and and then I guess I, I sort of um, gradually discovered the internet a bit more and became aware of all these crazy ultra races going on yeah. and I thought it'd be fun to see whether I could do one so, um, you know, I started off doing some local races, uh, 50k, 100k, yeah. and then thought I'll enter a 100 miler. And after that, it was a slippery slope, really. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you'd already been doing all these adventures, though, Mandy. Amazing. Before the event explosion, really, I think probably about 2010, I think events really right. started to take off. But yeah, big, big adventures running to London, then the marathon as well. Um, I was curious. <clears throat> 
had you, I suppose, did you see the, the growth of the London Marathon when you first did it to recent times? I imagine it changed quite a lot over the years. Oh, gosh, it really has. Yes. Yeah. I mean, when when we first, when, when I first did it in 2000, no, what is it? I'm um, 19... 88 it was completely different i mean nowadays it's all high security um but but in those days it was just completely different and yeah. the, the part of london which has changed the most is the dock plans yeah, because yeah. when we first ran around it in those early years it was just all like a building site yeah um it was sort of open waste ground yeah and and nowadays it's you know it's the high tech sort of railway and all the tall buildings i mean yeah. that that bit it has totally, totally changed. 100%. I think that the one thing which hasn't really changed is the crowd support. Yeah. That's always been there. Um, but but the biggest changes really are the buildings around Docklands yeah. and, and the in, sort of intense high security around the event now. I remember once I did a run and I went out to um, Thames Barrier in Greenwich, yeah. um, past Greenwich, and to see um, the, the kind of lovely suburbs of Greenwich and then you go out to Thames Barry it's quite industrial out there so yeah, it's definitely um they'll change all yeah. that so there'll be there'll be expensive apartments <laughs> all down there so you know I imagine yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's all very quite a rich area isn't it yeah yeah so yeah you the, the um you just started discovering the internet and more more events yeah where, where did it go from there uh, well, uh, I mean, after I did my first 100 miler, I then <clears throat> spotted the um, the Thames Ring event, the 250 mile, and I really fancied the idea of that, and it, it seemed like a good event to do because cause where I live in Norfolk, it's mainly sort of flat trail running, yeah. and I thought, well, that, that would be a sort of sensible one to do um for my first sort of you know having a go at something really long distance so yeah. I didn't really want to attempt mountains or anything <laughs> at first and so I did the Thames Ring race in 2019 I had no idea whether I could finish it or not because it's <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of a big leap up from a hundred miler yeah. um, but I was just ever so determined I think every every event I go into I, I really want to finish yeah. and um, I mean I'm not a rich lady so that they're, they're quite a big investment sort of money wise often so, um, yeah. although having said that you know pound for mile I think these you know long distance <laughs> running events are actually very good value they are good value um, yeah but, but I don't sort of enter them lightheartedly you know I enter them really determined to finish and, yeah. and train for them and and I love the Thames Ring event I mean it took me to places I'd never been before in my mind oh, yeah. uh, you know experience the hallucinations for the first time <laughs> and um, I, I just absolutely loved it and I was just so over the moon to finish it um had a bit of fun as well on route I quite often try and take little fancy dress props with me yeah cool. on route <laughs> and um you know and as I'm sort of fundraising and people often sponsor me from my Facebook posts I try and try and give them a bit of good value for money yeah. <laughs> by having a bit of fun on route too so so, so yeah the Thames Ring race and then um I'd also sent off an application to the, for the spine race earlier that year yeah sort of expecting to be <laughs> declined and and sort of you know perhaps told what I had to do in order to get a place and, and okay. surprising surprisingly I got a place oh excellent <laughs> um so I thought oh dear <laughs> and um, what's the what's um, the application process what's the application process uh, like you, yeah you, you have to sort of um write a paragraph about yourself and all your experience yeah that you had um and also to perhaps include in it things which you still feel you you need to learn and yeah. what what you would do um, yeah. Um, you know what your sort of plan would be to to try to get accepted into it so so I, I noticed that they said one of the requirements or you know or, or useful um, sort of attribute would be sort of experience of sort of long distance adventures um, long distance hiking yeah. uh, self-survival so I, I knew I had all those bits from my previous adventures yeah. um because I've done things like slept on the summit of all the three peaks as well on my own and um, I've done a huge amount of sort of wild camping. So I felt wow. I had the sort of survival skills and the long distance running and hiking skills. Yeah. All that self-maintenance that you would need on the spine, you know, you've, you've yes, done it all. Yes. yes, absolutely. And I was sort of honest that I knew I lacked in the navigation skills, but I'd already booked in to do navigation training. Yeah. 
um, in the Peak District and, and my, so my application got accepted. So I then sort of threw <laughs> myself <laughs> into um, learning sort of navigation and went up to the Peak District for a couple of days and did some of the courses there and just did a huge amount of research um, and practiced and practiced and practiced. And even in yeah. Norfolk, we, you know, we could find hills um, to sort of hike up and down. So I, I did huge amounts of training with with my spine full gear on, you know, yeah, carrying right. the backpack and everything. Um, I learned how to use poles yeah. and really spent a long time preparing for that. I also did the Lakes in a Day event as a sort oh, that's of... That's a good one, yeah. Yes, which was, was really useful as a sort of, you know, you know, going over mountains and a bit of navigation and such stuff. And... So then it was in, it was the last spine of race before all the coronavirus um, started. And that was in 2020, mm-hmm. January 2020. Oh my goodness, literally then, what, what would have been about four or five weeks later, everything, yeah. everything changed. Everything started changing, yes. And so, so that was um, probably the hardest event I've ever done. Yeah. I'm really curious because you said you know you do take things serious you don't enter them lightly and you prepare well for them and yeah where you live isn't the hilliest of places do, are no. you self-coach do you have a coach right no no I've, I've never had a coach I'm all sort of you know self-coached but um having said that uh, I'm a member of a lovely running club Norwich Road Runners yeah and also I'm involved in a group called Norfolk Trail Runners yeah and they're a fantastic group based in North Norfolk. And um, the, the, the guy, Carmine de Grandis, you might have come across his I name mean, in the ultra yeah. world or the, the trail world. He's, yeah. he's such a lovely, generous chap. And he set up the group. And now there's quite a few people involved with it. And I, I just learned so much from them and, fr- and from him in particular. Yeah. And even though Norfolk's fairly fa- flat, in North Norfolk, we've got quite a few good hills. Okay. And there's an area of training camp called Roman, a uh, tr- training ground called Roman Camp. Yeah, which has got some really really steep inclines and I learned a lot there about sort of you know technical running and technical hiking yeah. and sometimes I'd go up to there um, quite often on my own I'd spend sort of five or six hours yeah. with all the full spine pack on and everything and I'd choose the most horrible weather day to go hey, and amazing. I'd literally go and go up and down the hills and, and until I was sort of dropping with exhaustion and <laughs> and I would practice eating and, you know, sort of trying to simulate as much as possible, yeah. um, perhaps some of the conditions we might have. So, yeah. so sometimes I could get up to about 10,000 foot of elevation, yeah. you, you know, in, in a full day, up at, even in Norfolk, just going up and down the same hills. It was a bit boring sometimes, but... <laughs> It's amazing um, prep, and that's amazing for our listeners to listen to this. Hopefully, um, yeah, really, really respect the event and what you've done there. You know, the isolation—that's a very common thing for such an event like the, the spine. You can have hours and hours on your own on the, on yes. the, on the trails. Yeah, and I mean, I don't mind being on my own when I'm running. I I'm quite happy running with other people and being yeah. sociable and friendly. But I also don't mind being on my own. And um, and sometimes when you're really struggling in an event, you sort of almost need to go inside yourself and yeah. To just focus on keeping going um but but yeah it, you know it, it wasn't ideal training around Norfolk but we made the best of what we have I think so. that's it um you know we all where I live say with the Lake 100 coming up but the the moors are a nice training ground but they don't replicate the mountains of uh the lakes and if you were maybe doing an event like UTMB the lakes don't represent the mountains <laughs> and an event no. like that but you just have to make uh, the best of what you've got. Exactly. You know, we're all jug- juggling lives and family commitments yeah. and work commitments. Um, so, yeah, we all just do what we can. Fast forward a bit to 2021. Now you're going to do run backwards and forwards in a tunnel, which is <laughs> pa- pancake flat on tarmac. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I saw that. Every, you know what? I'm going to say this event looked bonkers, but every event that I see that Mark Cockburn does, looks insane but not you know sometimes i used to think it was just a suffer fest but it's not that always seems to be something more than just the pain involved i'm not too sure what it is this just seems to be something else you go a bit deeper than just slogging it out but could you explain what the tunnel was 
as an as an event okay well it, it's de described as a sensory deprivation event <laughs> and um i mean first of all I, it's an event i always vowed i would never do yeah. um be because i like the trails i like a pretty view i mean who would want to run up and down in the dark yeah. for 55 hours yeah. <laughs> and and also um you know whenever i looked at it i looked at the time limit it's 55 hours and and that's really tight yeah and i, I kind of like i'm sensible about my running and i thought i'm not actually good enough to do that i really didn't think i could okay. do it I got enticed into it by a very good friend um, who kept sending me little tunnel messages saying, go on, do it, do it. Oh, we've all got those friends. <laughs> yeah, wonderful friend called Carl Baxter, who also completed it. Oh, and um, lovely guy. And so, of course, I kind of like got curious, wondering what it was like in the tunnel. And then that was it. It was too late then. I'd entered the event. Oh, um, so, yeah, it's described as a sensory deprivation event with, you know, little and no support really you basically have your supplies stored in a plastic crate at one end of the tunnel yeah and you have to run up the tunnel it's described as 200 miles but it's actually more like 208 miles because yeah, okay. the tunnel is just over a mile long okay and, th and that extra eight miles that makes a big difference when you're on a tight time limit yeah um so, so you run up the tunnel you go over the timing mats at the other end of the tunnel mm. you turn around and you come back down again yeah um and the, the tunnel does have low level lighting okay i see so it's not completely pitch black but it's probably a little bit like running out in in the normal night time because yeah. you know even even when you're running out at night um it's not totally black there's sort yeah. of you know a little bit of light from the stars or yeah. you know you know whatever's around you so so it's very similar just to running out at night and the, the thing which worried me most about the event is having done because by that stage I've done three events of 200 miles plus and and I knew that, that with the sleep deprivation the one thing that helps you to stay awake is the daylight that re really helps you um so so i knew the biggest challenge with the tunnel what i felt for me was going to be the biggest challenge was not covering the distance but obviously covering the distance within the time limit because you pretty much got to run all of it yeah. and and also trying to stay awake um i knew that was just going to be a huge huge challenge oh my and goodness, yeah. You, you know, I'd ex experienced in other events at the end of the spine race and also in another one I've done, Dead Man's Ultra. Yeah. You know, actually, when you do actually fall asleep on your feet and it's a bit of a weird experience when you, <laughs> you, you suddenly realise you've just fallen asleep and <laughs> sort of oh, wow. trudging along. So, 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 so they were the really big challenges for me. And um, But I was really up for the challenge. I desperately wanted to finish it. Um and you know it was i just went into it incredibly determined i did loads of preparation and i researched lots of things like um you know have, trying to try and think of ways which would help me to stay awake yeah when i was falling asleep so so i went into the event with um one or two sort of you know ideas which i hoped would help um i had sort of various different lighting options for starts as well as my head torch i took a chest lamp yes and also a little hand torch yeah because sometimes when i was running along i used to find that the, the sort of light above my head sort of made me feel more sleepy i'm not too sure why but uh, so, so i went in as sort of various different lighting options because at night they turn the lights off in the tunnel <laughs> and so, so, so in theory it's pitch black now that they had an electrical fault and only half of the lights went off so it was only half of the tunnel which was pitch black yeah um, but for that part, you definitely needed your head torch or your other lighting. Um, but but the, the, the best, the thing which helped me most of all was I took along um, a little squirty bottle of water <laughs> and I, I literally sprayed myself in the face Excellent. with this squirty <laughs> bottle of water as I was going along. And that really, really helped. Yeah. And because obviously it wasn't going to rain in the tunnel and there wasn't no, no, going to no. be the sort of natural you know elements which you, you get which even though they're uncomfortable when you're outside they do actually help you just stay it, what, awake what was it like in the tunnel the, the, the temperature was it, you know was it was it windy or cold hot okay it's quite interesting because it's almost like got its own little microclimate in the tunnel and um when you when you sort of 
go could go up one way it felt as it felt as though we're going slightly uphill and yeah. i think there was a very slight incline um and it also um it was quite warm when you were inside the tunnel and yeah. then as you got to the edge of the tunnel you could sort of feel a slight breeze um and then it always felt as though that the breeze was against you slightly in one direction <laughs> yeah. and then when you turned around and went back it felt as though it was behind you so so, so, so there was a little bit of its own microclimate, um, although obviously not the usual elements that we're sort of battling yeah. <laughs> in other races. And and then there's also a part in the tunnel where they play spooky violin music, oh, sort of in, in the <laughs> middle of the tunnel. And and that's going on. So every time you run past it, there's this really sort of weird violin music playing, um, <laughs> which is, is, drives you a bit crazy as well. I was wondering also, you said it's microclimate. Did it have its own, um, was it just the runners or was the, I don't know, I kind of thinking rats, was the rats and stuff running around as well? <laughs> okay. Well, well, it's a cycle tunnel. So that so during the daytime, it was quite busy. Oh, with, right. Yeah. Um, well, there were actually cyclists going through the tunnel and yeah. other walkers and people. Um, so, and then obviously during the evening and the nighttime, that completely, we, we were the only ones there. Yeah. There, there wasn't really any wildlife except for um, the dog riding the bicycle, uh. <laughs> which was one of my best hallucinations. Classic. And, <laughs> and um, I, I did actually see a lot of rats in the tunnel, but there weren't really rats there. They, they, were, there. <laughs> they, they were imaginary rats. Um, so, so no, there wasn't actually any other particular wildlife apart from the ones in my imagination. <laughs> Yeah. You know, when, when um, I, I was watching the event, I just didn't appreciate that. Yes, during the day, at least, you would be sharing it with just uh, the regular public. Um, did you, you yeah. know, as you, how did you, how did you pace? I'm really curious. There's no GPS in, in the tunnel and no. you are on a strict kind of time deadline. H how did you pierce it okay well well I'd, I'd sort of realized i wouldn't have gps so what i'd done is uh, i'd sort of sat down and worked out a little plan that would get me to the finish just in time if i was able to stick to it and i had it all typed out on a small piece of paper which i sort of you know laminated and i kept that with me yeah so so and what i did was um i'd sort of worked out that i needed to be say at 50 miles by such and such a time of day okay do yeah because I could look at my watch and see what time of day it was. Yeah. Because um, normally when we're running, we think, okay, if we're keeping it under, you know, 13 minute miling all the way, we're okay, aren't exactly. we? Yeah. But, but I did, you know, obviously didn't have that to, to um, guide to go by. Yeah. So, so, so I had on this piece of paper, you know, the mileage or, or the laps that I needed to be back be at by a certain time of day yeah. from the Friday and then needed to be say 100 miles by such and such a time on the on the Saturday yeah and and I'd sort of broken it down quite carefully knowing that I'd do the first 50 miles you know at quite a steady pace and wanted to do that in 10 hours what would be the minute mile then if you for the cutoffs uh oh for uh, i finished with four minutes to spare and my overall um minute miling was i think it was um about 15 and a half minute yeah. miling you can't really take a rest can you, you, you no really no but that sort of includes all the breaks and things yeah, um yeah. you know when you sit down when you go to the toilet and <laughs> yeah, and things like that so so there wasn't really any time you know, for a lot of walking or, yeah. you know, big rests or anything like that. Uh, yeah. the, the, the faster runners, they were able to take longer breaks. That's and um, But as a bit of a plodder, I pretty much had to keep going. I, I, I did take a couple of breaks. You know, sometimes if I'm out walking the, or running with the dog and I see the same person a few times, the third time I see hello is a bit awkward. How did that, um, as you consistently passed runners um okay did you have little conversations that were just repetitive well, conversations but it, very... it was really nice it, especially you know at the beginning when there were a lot of us in the tunnel we, we were just all encouraging each other Brilliant. you know and saying hello well done and um you, you know we sort of learned each other's names and everything and that <laughs> bit was really friendly actually it was really yeah. really nice it was it was quite sad sort of you know a lot of people dropped out at about the 100 mile mark okay 
So there were some people who were there sort of to try and reach their 100 mile goal. And then there were a few people who were doing um, one of Mark's other events, the Long Lass race, Okay. Um, a few weeks later. So they were sort of saving themselves for that race. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there were some people who, you know, perhaps were really struggling or they were injured and that they were dropping out. So, yeah. so, so off, you know, after about from sort of Saturday evening onwards there were a lot fewer of us in the tunnel and I think then we weren't so cheerful as we said hello to each other <laughs> we, it's a, we, we were still nice to each other but it became more sort of grunts you know <laughs> and um or sometimes you know some of the other runners I think what on earth is that person saying and I realized they're a bit delirious <laughs> and um and I was probably a bit delirious at times and talking a load of nonsense <laughs> yeah and listening <laughs> no, but it, it was so you know th there's so much support for each other and, and I think there is in these ultra races because it's not about winning you yeah. know everybody's there because they want to finish it and yeah. you really want the other runners to finish it too um you actually feel really sad when people have to drop out yeah. and there was one point when my friend Carl Baxter who'd sort of enticed me into the event yeah. and he said oh my ankle's gone and, and um he said oh I'm gonna pull out and I said well you know you know don't just go just go and talk to Mark at the tunnel entrance yeah. and yeah. I sort of you know I didn't know quite what would happen but I know I know Mark Cockbane you know I thought well, maybe he could help him or something and um oh, words and of wisdom <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so then um, I carried on up the tunnel and I came back down the tunnel and I saw my friend Carl coming up the tunnel again and I thought great he's still Yay. going <laughs> and, he, and I said what happened and he said oh I took my tracker off and I went and handed it into Mark and told him I was going to give up um because I'd hurt my ankle he said and he handed it straight back to me and said nobody ever died of a sore ankle <laughs> put it back on and get back out there um and and his sort of ankle injury actually sort of wore off after about 10 miles so I was just so pleased that he managed to keep going and he got stronger and stronger as he went to it long yeah. and and Carl finished about three quarters of an hour ahead of me and I was just so pleased for him um so, so over the moon because it was his second attempt at it yeah and I think that sort of thing can quite often happen on these very long distance races. You, you, you feel a bad niggle and you think it might be a race stopping niggle. Yeah. But sometimes if you can keep going, it yeah. either wears off or everything else hurts so much that you don't feel it anymore. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, you start prioritizing the pins. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Something else takes priority and, you, you know, you realize... Be it must be so tempting like sometimes on a race when you aren't feeling good um to get a lift back from a checkpoint point might actually take you longer than to, to complete the race in some situations but with a, a race like the tunnel if you're feeling a bit sorry for yourself you it'd be quite easy just to stop at the end of each each, each lap in effect so yeah well done carl for getting out there and then like you see him running yeah. off the pin and um completing the event amazing <laughs> yeah no he, he was great he really was <laughs> yeah so and he's, he's a real he's a real gentleman as well but you, you know i think most people in the running world are aren't they, they well it's, you know, it's it's such a lovely community i think you, yeah. when, when you said about the trail running community too I, I enjoy the road i enjoy the trail yeah but it's definitely a warmer community on the trails i'd say um hope i'm not going to get any grief for saying that <laughs> no <laughs> but i think i think there's a lot of um you know sort of survival and looking out for each other isn't there it's, it's yeah. qu quite a lot of the time as i say it's not about winning the event or anything i mean the, you know the lovely thing about the cockbane events is that you know they don't have podium prizes either it's yeah. it's about completing it isn't it yeah. and, and oh. i think i think um most of these sort of trail and ultra events you know you, you just want to see everybody around you safe yeah. um and finish it safely and you know sort of finish it for your own personal goals and satisfaction and even when people don't finish you know you then want to see that they're okay and that they're looked after and um you know you don't worry about pbs or anything do no, you it's no. just about getting through the event and but def definitely my mindset would be um when i first started doing ultras and definitely one of uh mark Copian events is could i finish it yeah that would be the the main fear it would not be about pbs or anything like that it would be just yeah my goodness no. me. Am, I, am, am i able to to finish that don't know finishes do you know i'm not too sure if you know the the stats i think it was about 29 people started um do you know how many people completed it for the tunnel um yeah, yeah 
think there were actually 26 of us on the start line okay. um because there, there's always sort of last minute dropouts yeah and four of us finished it oh wow and <laughs> I, I i was last <laughs> but i was very happy to be last <laughs> yeah yeah it's fantastic that is a high dropout and you know we said at the beginning of the interview first uh lady ever finisher of of the tunnel so that is well apparently i mean i i i didn't have a spectacular finish at all it was um and, and i sort of have to be honest about about the end because i did actually lose my mind at about mile 193 um right. I'd, I'd pretty much held myself together and up until that point but what happened apparently was um to, I, I started wandering around in the tunnel. Okay. Uh, I, I, basi I basically completely lost it in my head. And I can remember thinking that I was dreaming and I was trying to wake up from my dream. And I had yeah. this sort of idea that I was dreaming I was doing the tunnel ultra. <laughs> and I, I couldn't work out how to wake up for it, from oh, it. And, and the, the hallucinations had become so extreme that I couldn't actually see where I was going. Oh, wow. and, so so apparently I was sort of wandering around in the tunnel. So they sent um, my friend Andy Bailey, who had been helping out with the sort of crew, um, yeah. sort of making teas and coffees for everybody, up to the tunnel to find me. Yeah. And he brought me back to the tunnel entrance. And and they said, what had happened is I'd gone up the tunnel, but not gone over the timing mats yeah. and come back down again. So that lap didn't count. Oh, oh no. So, so I still had eight more laps to do. Yeah. But what they decided then, Mark Cockbane was incredibly generous and he gave my friend Andy special permission to accompany me just okay. to see that I went in the right direction and that I kept yeah. safe. Yes. <laughs> and you know, providing he didn't, you know, pick me up and carry me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of thing. So and um, so he accompanied me for the last sort of eight miles up and down the tunnel. And then on the very last lap, you know, Mark said, you, you're going to have to run really fast. It's very tight on the time limit. And I think he was very kind. I think he wanted to see uh, me finish. Yeah. And and then for the last bit of it, he actually came along be behind me on his bicycle. Oh, and he was shouting at me, you've got to run faster. You need to sprint. <laughs> <laughs> and... <laughs> So how you and gathered yourself? Because you said you'd lost your mind, but then you seem relatively kind of coherent with your memory of this last uh, yes. session. Yeah, yeah, I, I can rem Well, after um, Andy had sort of come to find me in the tunnel, um, I, I, that sort of brought me back to reality. Yeah. So I can remember most of what sort of happened after there quite, quite, you know, easily. Um, yeah. Some of it's a bit of a blur, but um, mo most of that, I think the bit which I don't really remember is, sort of what happened bet between mile 192 and mile 193. Okay. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I just can't recall any of that bit at all. And that must have been the bit where I'd literally sort of fallen asleep on my feet yeah. and, you, you know, really was didn't know where I was at all. Mm. And I've heard, of, I've heard other people talk about that happening and I've never actually experienced it before. And it was a really interesting experience in yeah. hindsight. Um, I'll probably try not to repeat it again. <laughs> no, no, no. My, it's, my mind is blown by this. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was really grateful to be allowed to finish it off and to finish off those last eight miles. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I was very grateful to the people who gave me a little bit of support over yeah. that last bit. Um, all, all credit to them. And for, yeah, four, four minutes to spare. Wow, that is like, um, yeah. that is really tight. I've seen some pictures of you in a chair and I'm, I hope you don't mind me seeing this. You absolutely spent everything you had. You 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 get you gave to that mm -hmm. race. How do you re recover after something? What, what did you do? Did you have any kind of post race indulgences or treats, or did you you whisked away to a fancy hotel or something? What what, what did you do after that? <laughs> um, well, that afterwards, I mean, you are, yes, you are right. I did give it absolutely everything I had because because I think I was completely spent at. 190 miles to be honest yeah. and um and so, so I did give everything I had and a whole lot more and then I, I think I pretty much collapsed afterwards and I I, I can I, I know they sort of helped me because you there you can't park a car right near the entrance so okay. we'd had to walk half a mile to get to the tunnel entrance <laughs> and it was um a lady called um Berit 
Jessen and and then Carl Baxter and Andy Bailey who sort of helped me back to the car. Yeah. I think they pretty much sort of supported, carried, dragged me back to the car, and and then then we got back to the hotel and um, my friend Andy actually paid for us to have a better hotel bedroom there. Oh, what a star! And, <laughs> Yeah, really kind and they just sort of helped me up to you know the hotel bedroom popped me on the bed re- removed my socks and shoes and left me <laughs> to sleep <Left> <laughs> um and um I mean I was quite safe you, you know and yeah. um and and I think I just needed to sleep I just needed to be horizontal and to sleep yeah. and and they were just such gentlemen and you know just kindly you know got me somewhere safe where I could rest and yeah. Um, and I, I can just never thank them enough because, you know, I felt it was a real privilege actually to be able to, you know, have that chance to push yourself way beyond your, your limit. Yeah. You know, we, we don't often get a chance in life where you can literally push yourself totally beyond anything you've ever done before. Okay. But the sort of knock on effect is then somebody else has to pick up the pieces, don't they? <laughs> um, you know, when you, you do completely sort of pretty much collapse at the end and, yeah. and, you know, obviously I wasn't planning it that way because no, no. <laughs> um, you don't know these things are going to happen until you experience it. But but looking back on it, I just feel so grateful, um, you know, to the people who helped me at the end because they literally did pick up the pieces for yeah. me. And That's some wonderful know, people out there. Yeah, looked after me and saw that I was kept safe. And there's a lovely lady, Karen Weber, as well, who does the, um, you know, the timing. And she was so kind. She really was. So, so many people were kind and... You know, it's not just, you know, you know, might have been me, the lucky lady who got to run it. But, yeah. you know, and it, you don't achieve these things without, you know, kind support around. Oh, you. well, there's a, there's a big network of people involved in um, all, yeah. all, all the races. And, and the race organisers, you know, I just think they do an incredible job because it can't be easy at all, um, oh, you wow. know, and for them and allowing people to push themselves so hard there's yeah. must must be quite scary for them sometimes <laughs> um, it is I've, I've been involved in a few organizing races and the two things i wanted to, to, to be was the actual race never came up short that would be quite stressful if the race was short and as soon as the last person was finished i could breathe a big sigh of relief and that was like oh my goodness me that's it everyone's, yes. everyone's done the race and they're all back home safely this is brilliant yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as a race organiser, you just must hope that everybody finishes it safely. You know, yeah. well, you know, it's okay afterwards because because they are extreme events, aren't they? You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, definitely. Really you pushing. Do you think you do it again? Um, no, I won't because I've done it. <laughs> it, it. If I hadn't finished it, I probably would have wanted to. Um, if I was younger I might do but but I'm 55 years old and I there, there's other events I want to do and I've got other sort of hopes and dreams yeah, so yeah. and because of the the nature of these very big events you can't really do more than about one a year because oh, um, yeah. so so I kind of like think well you, you know I've done that one I'll tick that one off the list and <laughs> <laughs> do something else next time <laughs> talking about other events yeah what <clears throat> yeah what would you like to do um, well, well, I haven't got anything planned at all for next year. I'm, I'm kind of going to have a bit of a downtime now and just sort of see what ha- happens. Um, you know, it's very good of my family to let me go off and do this. And, yeah. and I have to do other things like go to work, <laughs> and, you know, sort of um, family life, look after things at home. Um, so, so I haven't got, I mean, I've got a, just a small little 50k lined up in December, which I'm just doing with friends. Yeah. And, and I'll probably... Mm do some things next year but i haven't really decided what yet i might you know do like a hundred miler or maybe one of these looped events i i haven't got any plans at the moment which is quite a nice feeling in a way yeah, um, yeah just to have a bit of time of drifting and, and i'll just really enjoy running with my friends and see what see what happens <laughs> But I'm yeah. sure I'll definitely, I'll definitely do some big things in the future. I just haven't 
planned them yet or quite decided. <laughs> and I, I also really like um, helping other people with their running and sort of getting into ultra running. Yeah. And um, we, we started up this group called Nuts Norfolk Ultra Training Support. Oh, awesome. About um, three and a half years ago. And I've got some other admins now who help me with it. But that's very much it. It's a Facebook group. and and But it's really grown. It's a real thriving Norfolk community now, or sort of East Anglian community now. Yeah. And the, the whole idea really is to try and provide a really sort of friendly, supportive base for anyone who's trying to get into ultra running, yeah. um, who wants to ask questions questions and and we, we do sort of training events together and um recce's for local races and, and i really really enjoy you know just sort of helping anyone new to it because i think of ultra running it, it's it's a whole different thing to road yeah. running you know there's so much involved with all the equipment learning to look after your feet sort of self-management and yeah. so so i love i, I just really enjoy helping anyone you know with any questions or if anyone wants to go for a run with me and we yeah. chat about ultra running and you know we'll go and recce a local route together um and then Oof. quite often it's just very satisfying and you know nice to help other people as well yeah we'll share the facebook group actually in the show notes um so yeah if you get information off you after the after you've had a chat um that'd be great we pop that in there but yeah any advice then you took with this group um if anyone's listening to the podcast and thinking about taking on an ultra any any tips that you could pass on to them um people often ask me how do you train for these big events and i, I think it's like with all running you start with the little ones yeah. you know you do a 50k first and 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 sort of learn from that and um just like it when you first start running you first aim to do a 5k and then a 10k yeah and it's like, it's been much the same you know with ultra running you know do, do a smaller one first of all perhaps yeah. one that's not too challenging yeah. and, and then step up to something else and and just sort of gradually build up the distances and and whatever event you've entered into always try and simulate the the terrain and the conditions yeah. as much as you can in your training that's great advice. So if, if it's going to be a hot weather event, you know, we'll then try and train in hot weather and we'll practice yeah. with all the gear um, because different conditions will, will always throw up different problems. Yeah. Um, you, you know, people often ask me about nutrition and what should you eat? And, and I sort of say, well, you know, first of all, where's the race? You know, what are the conditions <laughs> yeah. like and yeah. how long is it? Because you know, there's such a variety of ultra distance events. So yeah. I think you know try and simulate the event as much as possible in your training yeah. and i think the, the biggest thing as well is foot care look after your feet um and i always say to people you know foot care should start today um you know not <laughs> not a week before your race not a month before your race it should be part of everyone's everyday routine and really look after your feet keep them yeah. nice and soft and um and wear big enough shoes you know be aware that your feet are going to swell when you do these long distance events and there's many a race that has ended premature for somebody because of bad foot yeah bad foot maintenance <laughs> it, yeah and, and it's, it's it's a real shame because often people are not injured and they're feeling okay yeah. but they're just in too much pain with the feet so yeah. You know, I think, yeah, le learn about foot care, learn how to tape your feet yeah. and really look after them. And when you go into a race, you know, go out there with everything that you need to, to sorry, a cat just went across That's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> everything that you need to look after your feet and, and never be, you know, always stop sooner rather than later um, yeah. to look after your feet. We talk about actually you should have mentioned this earlier maybe but um do you remember what kit you used for, for, for the uh ultra people always love to know what uh, people use poles shoes um stuff like that okay well which one do you mean for the tunnel or for Sorry, yeah for the tunnel um, yeah yeah for the tunnel yeah um well one of the advantages of the tunnels we didn't have to carry lots of stuff with us because you know we had our kit yeah. box at one end but I yeah I'm, I'm very simple with my kit um my running shorts are a pair that I bought from Tesco they were children's sports shorts I think Brilliant. age 15 to 16 years you got yeah. two pairs for 399 and I've had them about 10 years there you go. <laughs> um so no no fact Fancy running wear or no fancy um stuff in particular um just just a high-vis t-shirt and i iron some more high-vis on it anything really that's comfortable footwear i wear ultra running shoes okay and I, I get on really well with those because of the wide toe box and i size up sort of one and a half sizes so Ooh, that's not, quite a lot yeah 
Yeah, n- normally I'm size six for general footwear, but I wear size seven and a half shoes for these for general running and and I, I have them quite loose as well so that I can actually get the shoe on and off um without undoing the shoe laces yeah and uh I mean I have a sort of, a sort of running vest it's a Harrier trail vest which oh, is yeah. actually yeah. very kindly given to me by Kate at Harrier UK so really it's very simple kit that I use there's nothing fancy um to say one of my best bits of kit was my little um squirty bottle yeah which I little plant, little <laughs> squirty bottle which I it's like one of these little plant bottles which you spray plants with um but I just used to spray myself in the face of it to keep awake and how did you with all the hit you know because there was so much in the dark what was your head torch uh routine uh, well, I only used it during the night and um, when the lights switched off. And yeah. uh, I I use a, a Pretzel Mayo, which is the one I had for, the, I bought that for the Spine Race, actually. Okay. And it's just a really good head torch. And then I also had a, a Gato chest lamp. Oh, yes, yes. And I had I had plenty of batteries with me and chargers with me, um, but but I actually took along two head torches and two chest lamps. Somebody had lent me some extras for spares, so I didn't actually have to do any sort of swapping over of batteries oh, for charging, yeah. which was, you know, really... And, and they just work really well for me, so I shall carry on using them because they, they're, they're good. <laughs> oh, yeah, 100%. That's been fascinating to hear all about that. But I am really curious. Um, I've seen lots of sheep activity on your social media. We are, you've got two woolly mascots. I think um, uh, last time I saw a picture of them, they were, in a, they, they were, they were being bathed. Are they... They're actually here. Look, they want hey. to start. <laughs> you mentioned, I suppose, when you were on the trails, that started your kind of love for sheep. But I know you're heavily involved with an animal sanctuary too. Um, yeah, I'm super curious to find out some more about that side of your life. As I say, I've, I've always had a fondness for animals and I actually work in an animal sanctuary myself in quite a big one in Norfolk. And yeah, I just, just became really fond of sheep when I was out um, doing all these big solo adventures. Yeah. And then it was through Facebook, actually, by chance. Um, and when I was preparing to do the Centurion 100 miler, okay, yeah. and I, I think I'd sort of popped a little picture on of one of my shoes sheep mascots or something and um just for fun and then somebody sort of came in from the side and said oh hello you know if you ever want to see some real sheep you know if you're a sheep lover I've got some real sheep (laughs) and um you know didn't know quite who it was but I was interested so I sent a friend request and um started following Andy Bailey and his sheep sanctuary on Facebook and I was just sort of blown away, really, by what I saw. Uh, there was these, you know, this sort of wonderful gentleman who was caring for, you know, very old sheep and really yeah. looking after them so well and it clearly loved them so much and they all had different personalities. Yeah. And and then I sort of realised, you know, that he was trying to fund this all himself and was struggling quite a lot, actually, in the process because he works full time and... Yeah. Um, you, you know, working in an animal sanctuary myself, I thought, well, you know, normally people have help with this sort of thing. Yeah. So I offered to do some fundraising for him. I said, well, look, I like sheep. And I also have a, a sheep fancy dress costume, a really big one um, <laughs> called Big Sheep, which I've, you know, done various events in. It, it's, yeah. And I said, well, look, you know, I'll, I'll help. So, and, and he was so grateful. I've never met anyone more grateful in my whole life. Yeah. And so it sort of took off from there, really. And um, I did the Thames Ring race and I ran the London Marathon dressed up as a big sheep and did the spine race and all sorts of things. And I I do quite often go and, you know, visit the sheep sanctuary and, you know, get the chance to do some hands on stuff as well. Um, So how would a sheep sheep end up with the sanctuary? I'm really curious. Okay, well, uh, a lot of them come from uh, some people up in Yorkshire who show sheep. So they take them along to sort of agricultural shows. And when they come to the end of their sort of useful life, so they're no longer useful for breeding or or they're sort of perhaps getting too old for the show ring, rather than sending them off to the slaughterhouse, um, they let them come to Andy. So he gets quite a few from there, but he also... So now, because he's sort of becoming quite well known, he get, has contacts with other animal sanctuaries. Yeah. So um, quite often he'll get some through Hillside Animal Sanctuary if, if there's a call come in to Hillside and yeah. and they think, well, actually, these sheep 
you know, might be better suited to go to Andy's place. Yeah. Um, he picked up two um, last weekend from Norfolk, Rosie and Porridge. <laughs> and, and then, so, so he's had quite a few sort of via Hillside Animal Sanctuary. And, and then I think sometimes, you know, people just hear about him. And if they hear about some sheep that need a good home, well, then they will get in touch with Andy. And yeah, I mean, he's, Got, got up to about I think after he picks up the four this Thursday I think he'll be up to about 37 sheep oh my goodness me but, but they're, they're all quite elderly so yeah. a lot of them you, you know sheep don't normally live to that age you know most of the sheep we see out in fields um you know they're lucky if they get to sort of three four years old and they're yeah. all females yes um, but you very rarely get boy sheep that live That's beyond right. sort of six months old um so so the sheep that Andy have got you know quite a lot of them have perhaps a limp you know or have some sort of you know special health need and they yeah. some of them are having medicine every day um he's got three old girls who are sort of on bed rest and they're, and yeah. they're really nearing the end of their lives but yeah. He's giving them as long as possible, you know, so, so long as they're okay and comfortable and enjoying yeah. their food. Um, you know, sort of part of his sanctuary is almost like a hospice for the, the, the yeah, very old yeah, sheep. Yeah. So uh, it, it's just fantastic what he does. Um, so say he does it all on his own. Well, you know, yeah. he has some help from friends, you know, when they can. But other than that, he's pretty much doing it single-handedly. And, you and can know, people can people pop if they pop along to the website, can they make a, a, a donation to support the sanctuary? Yeah, absolutely. Um, he doesn't have a website, but there's a Facebook page link for the Milkwood Rest Home for Retired Sheep, which we can perhaps share. And, yeah. you know, and he does have a GoFundMe page. And also I have my own ongoing um, fundraising page a just giving page yeah for for the sheep sanctuary and the, the lovely thing is every single penny goes to help to care for the sheep because yeah. Andy, Andy works full-time he doesn't take a wage for anything he does yeah They're, everything I do is voluntary you know all the people who help him everything's done voluntarily so every single penny raised goes directly to the sheep's care yeah. Um, you know, to pay for their hay, feed, vets' bills, shearing, foot trimming, all sorts of things that needs to happen. Well, there's an endless list of jobs, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We'll definitely share that if you could forward me all those um the links to the different various groups and we'll pop that in oh. the show notes and hopefully our community will uh show you some support. That's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Well, it's been such a treat, Mandy. Um, but well, as always, we do five quick questions at the end. Um, they're nothing too deep. Uh <laughs> I'll answer them. I'll I'll try and uh ask them quick. Um you can take as long as you'd like to before to answer them. Um, first question is do you prefer running in the night or the day? Oh, oh gosh! I actually quite like running at night. Yeah, that's a bit weird, isn't it? <laughs> I like them both, but there is something very peaceful about running at night. It's yeah. usually quieter, isn't it? And yeah, so just right now, I'll say I quite like running at the night. In the night, yeah, yeah, I like the night. Once I've acclimatized to um, the, the first few weeks, when you start putting your head torch on, I get a bit kind of spooked by noises and other people out on the trails that I'm not expecting to be there. But once I've like got used to it, it's like, yeah, I think yeah. I do prefer the night. Do you have a favorite uh, training session? Yes, yeah. I love going up to this place called Roman Camp in North Norfolk, and they have got some really steep hills. <laughs> and I just, <laughs> I love endlessly going up and down the hills. They've got one hill in particular, which is called Cry Hill. Oh. And it's <laughs> it's so steep that you, you can't really run up at all. So quite often it's a run down the hill and then a hike up the hill, but it's a wonderful workout. Excellent. And I, I really love it. <laughs> I love that. Nice. <laughs> do you have a favorite breed of sheep mm, i would say usually no but maybe i do now because a lot of andy's sheep or perhaps you know about half of them are ryland sheep yeah and they are just lovely they're like big cuddly teddy bears and they're so oh, friendly <laughs> and I, I like all sheep and you know i'd help any sheep but i, I do think um the Ryland sheep are, are just particularly adorable yeah i was just curious with the sheep is do, do you notice like personalities within different breeds oh oh um i'd, I'd say personalities within different sheep i don't know whether you i'm not knowledgeable enough about sheep to know yeah. whether 
there's a difference in personality between breeds. Yeah. Um, there, there might be sort of based on survival instincts and survival needs, but but definitely within the sheep. I mean, I mean, some of them are just sort of so cheeky. Um, <laughs> they're, they're very food orientated sheep. They really do like their food. Yeah. Um, so some of them are more boisterous than others. Yeah. Um, some of them are more shy. Um, you know, there, there's one called um, Aberforth, and he's he's just so funny because he always coming up to sort of Andy and sort of you know almost like headbutting him and butting yeah. him with his head but he's doing it in a sort of friendly way yeah, yeah. Um, almost like sort of play fighting <laughs> and but then some of the sheep um they're just so gentle I mean Momo the one who died last December yeah. who I've been doing my sort of year of miles for Momo for for she was just such a gentle sheep um just such a very lovely gentle kind sheep and it yeah. sounds odd to say that a sheep is kind but no. you, you know you, you just sort of get this feeling about them and, and the way they treat you and the others around them and then some of them are just completely boisterous you know they'll be straight in there they'll <laughs> they'll knock all the poorly ones out of the way because they just want the food yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> they just sound like dogs <laughs> yeah yeah they def definitely have different personalities it doesn't have to be your favorite film but maybe a film that you remember seeing more than once Oh, I know which one that is straight away. And I'm yeah. trying to think, it's it's the one, because this sounds awful, doesn't it? But it's the one where the guy cuts his arm off to get out of the, um, oh. hold it, 154 hours or something like that, is it? Yeah, he falls, he, he gets trapped basically, doesn't he? he yeah, to... he, he, he falls into the, the canyon, doesn't he? And the rock, yeah. or, or the rock falls on him. Yeah. And... And he, that sounds awful, doesn't it? Because I'm really quite a gentle middle-aged lady. <laughs> and, I, and I don't like nasty films, but that's not a nasty film. That's an adventure no. film, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And um, I, I think my son's introduced it to me and said, oh, mum, you know, you like adventure. You need to watch this. And yeah. and it was, I think it was just, you know, the sheer extreme lengths that somebody will go to to survive. Yeah. And I've watched that film several times. Yeah. And then the other one I, I like, and I can't quite remember the the name of it. But it's the one where the guy crawls down off the mountain, um, and in the snow, and he pulls himself down off the mountain. The one where his friend has to cut the rope. Oh, and oh my goodness me! Touching the void. You, sorry. Is Touch the Void, yeah. Touching the Void, yes, yeah. yeah that's yeah. I would say those two. I mean, I've watched Touching the Void several times. Obviously, not recently because I can't remember <laughs> the name of it. Yeah. But um, I, I think you know those those sort of films because they're about extreme endurance and, yeah. and the extreme will to survive, whatever yeah. the conditions. Um, and I know, know we do. It seems like a real poor comparison, but as runners. It comes up quite often we have to be problem solvers um yes exactly these guys had to solve problems that would save their life <laughs> like yeah. but, um you know as, as a runner out there on the trail sometimes um yeah we have to kind of just kind of adapt and and change with what's in front of you like you mentioned earlier about um you know know the event that you're doing and prepare for that event but sometimes you may have trained in uh the nice british summertime and then you do an event maybe in autumn and it throws a, a right curveball with the weather at you but just yeah to, to solve the problems absolutely yeah I mean I remember when I did the spine race and um you, you know because I couldn't simulate the extreme snow or anything like that and when we were up on cross fell um there were the winds must have been almost 100 miles an hour and there were deep snow and it was so it was so windy that I couldn't actually stand up I was just being knocked oh, flat my and there was a point where for about a quarter of a mile I had to roll I, I couldn't actually stand up so I just laid down and I rolled myself along you know just to get over like the top of the ridge to where the yeah. wind dropped a little bit yeah yeah, yeah. and you know, just sort of times like that, and and my feet were so sore. But you, I remember sort of running down the mountain, and always just kind of like hurling myself down the mountain, because um, <laughs> so, you know you, you have to sort of adapt in those conditions, don't you? You yeah. know, either that or press the SOS button and be pulled yeah. out of the race. But yeah. yeah, you have to think. Well, if I can't get along in this way, is there a different way that I can get along? Hundred percent. Yeah, the two great films there. Go and check them out, mm -hmm. listeners. Um, did you, I'm not too sure if you were thinking about this when you're hallucinating at the tunnel, but um, were you, is there any kind of treat you particularly fancied or indulged in after, after um, it doesn't have to be the tunnel, it could be the spine or any big, you know, arduous event, it's something you go for. 
Okay, always a cup of tea. <laughs> tea, already you'd be uh, agreeing with you there. <laughs> and, yeah, 100%, just a nice, strong, ordinary cup of tea. Um, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> I go for a treat after anything. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I've had a blast, Mandy. Uh, really appreciate your time today. Um, you take care and oh, um, all the best you with your mum. No worries, it's been a wonderful chat. Thank you ever such a lot, Gary. It's been lovely chatting to you. I really appreciate it. It's very kind of you to invite me. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. (laughs) Bye-bye. Legend and uh, a soul sister with her wanting her favorite thing post race, post race, post long adventure, a cup of tea. Yeah, oh. yeah, it was great. I asked her, you know, what, what what she was looking forward to, what a treat was, and it was just a nice brew. <laughs> nice brew. I'm gonna when I do my race when it because I get halfway. <clears throat> At the halfway turnaround, I'm going to change my kit and uh, uh, get warm, ready to go in, because I'm going to go into the night and yeah. I'm going to take a flask of tea because there's no way the French are going to have some PG tips at that <laughs> checkpoint, are they? So, <laughs> I'm going to have in my bag my flask of tea and as I'm changing into my win- night wear, I'm going to be like downing the flask. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? We had a chat with uh, oh Merrill and about some sleep admin and caffeine, and I was just I thought of you as I had a cup of tea literally before I went to bed last night. I, I didn't a... have one because <laughs> then I was like, Bryn was like after supper, like, do you want a cup of tea? And I was like, oh, I do, but now I feel like maybe it keeps me awake, <laughs> but then nothing keeps me awake. I get into bed and go, oh, oh. yeah, I love that. When I can't remember actually physically. Oh, me honestly. too. Those are the best. The yeah. best. When I get in, I open my Kindle. That's when Bryn normally likes to start a conversation. I'm like, you're joking. <laughs> I literally just open my book. And then I go, so about, I'm like, you haven't said anything for the, like the last hour. And then I fall asleep <laughs> with my Kindle on my face. Dribbling. Dribbling. And then I wake up and I just like slide it under my pillow. And then I don't wake, uh, I don't wake up again until normally some small person at about five o'clock nice decides, poking. yeah, decides that our bed is the best place to be and pulls the duvet. Ooh. And I just, I was like, come on, girls, come in, come in. Sleep. <laughs> we've got the extra, we bring that, we brought the heavy sheet out cupboard for, Ooh. for winter. I love it. We have proper quilts on our beds because we don't have any heating in our um, we have oh. our fire downstairs and we like that at like three or four. If my, if Bryn's working at home, he likes it at like midday. If he's here, we're allowed to have it lit like at lunchtime. <laughs> if he's not here, it doesn't get it lit. If it doesn't get lit till like seven, then the house is really, really cold. It sounds but, like Oliver Twist in your house. It's like Oliver Twist, but we have quilts. <laughs> we have proper winter, you know, it's old school. We yeah. sleep in like proper jammies, jumpers, yeah. quilts, because there's no heating upstairs. But I like it like that. It's fresh. I do like, yeah, we have a little window open, and I do like we've got the blankets out on the sofa for in the wind. Oh, yeah, gotta have the, gotta have the black. Well, we got the dogs too. Yeah, Rex likes a cuddle. Bring them up, yeah. bring them up. <laughs> we fight over the warmer one. <laughs> I'm like, I'll have that one. Follow over here, come and lie on me. Uh, anyway, what's coming up? Oh, big red. <laughs> Big red big race. Race. <laughs> this is in like bold red on uh, the uh, on our superscript. The Peak District, South and North. Tell us all about it, Gary. Have you done this, Gary? I might have done this one. Yeah, um, it is a super duper race. Um, you your bit you base in Edial, which anyone who's in the spine knows all about Edial. Um, and it's probably a lot different with COVID. But when I did it, I slept in the village hall in Edial. And day one is they bust you off somewhere on blanking on where it is, and you basically run back to Edale. And then day two, you start at Edale, and you run somewhere else. And uh, I'm, again, I'm blanking on where you finished. But it's a lot of spine um, that sounds territory. Pretty cool. Yeah, day one is quite quick, actually. Day one's more on di- the majority of it's on disused um, railway tracks. It passes the Monsell Trail. So, you know, at Bakewell, that kind of part of the country. <clears throat> and... Um, yeah, a lot of people doing kit prep. When I was there, there was some a uh, bunch of guys from overseas, and they were doing like they were in, in for the spine, but they had all their kind of packs and all the stuff they were carrying. Good, it's good timing for spine preparation. That as yeah, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't huge. I don't know what the entries are like this year, but it wasn't huge numbers. And day two, 
I mean, you just had a fabulous time. It was the first day I felt I was the first time I'd actually raced. And it, it was probably unfair on the guy that we beat, but just and I were together. We raced together. He didn't know our kind of thought process, but we just got some. Good- he didn't know you were taking him down. But day one was so it wasn't funny for Justin. Justin was way ahead of me. Um but he took a wrong turn and then um, <laughs> I profited from that wrong turn and came in first. <laughs> it was awesome. Yeah. We've got to know the route, Gary. <clears throat> he came, he came in, he came into the finish at EGL and he looked pretty. Was he sexy. raging him? Pretty, no, he just looked like, you know, sorry <laughs> for through himself. the brambles. But day two, he, he, stayed, he stayed with me because I had the course on my watch. So he, he didn't, he was old school with the map and obviously oh. bless him. But, um, yeah, he stayed with me day two and we finished together. It was great. I've done this race too, actually, the Waller Trail Marathon. And there's a half marathon too. And I think it doesn't look too bad. I think it's going to be windy, but, oh, you know, people don't think the, uh, you know, the elevation stuff like that around in in England yeah, yeah. is anything to kind of worry about. But around the Cheviot, if it's it not be, nice. Yeah. I mean, I only really know it from the end of the spine when people yeah. are like, I can't go up there. I can't go up there or mm. suffer. It Terribly. was absolutely grim. I, remember, I just remember just so much rain, cold, wind. And they, these climbs aren't huge, but yeah, it's Relentless. quite unforgiving. It's quite yeah, unforgiving. Yeah. So good luck, everybody up there with the trail outlaws. Um, yeah, doing the, either the half marathon or the trail, the full marathon. It's a really great event coming up. How are you going to survive? How am I going to survive? <laughs> I am just going to play it by ear. Simple as that. Organic. Do the organic. Yeah. Do the I'm weight try. the organic range. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to try a session. I am going yeah, to try. Yeah. yeah. What, what is ahead in the plan is actually, um, so I had this six times 1K. I've got a 20-minute threshold run. It's supposed to be a marathon pace run this weekend. And then next week, there is cross countries too. So there's some things coming up. And I'm just going to try i'm going to try either the six times a k or the threshold run and i might even try the marathon effort run too and then i'll probably save myself for cross countries because that's quite important for the team um depending on how many we've got running actually if i need to score or not um but yeah just play by ear i can't you can't do anything about it really it's as simple as that you know we listen to other podcasts i think um marathon talk martin yellen didn't just kind of come jumping out of his front door after he um, suffered. Oh, what a beautiful morning. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, because I think it's hard as well. If they give you like 10 days that you think, oh, I should be better. Why not better? It's kind yeah. of like, well, you're allowed to be, you should just get on with life. But, but he, he made a good point. And I didn't even know this, this uh, knowledge existed, but there was this kind of back to exercise protocol, um, which I didn't even know was there. So thanks for mentioning that, Martin. That was good. Uh, Which yeah. you've totally ignored and just tried to totally jump back ignored. on him. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm doing some uh, some heavy turbo trainer research. That's what's oh, yes, you've big been admin. me on late night, <laughs> late night WhatsApp. <laughs> what's your turbo trainer, Eddie? What's your turbo trainer? I'm not sure I want to share that. I'm not sure what I want to jump into turbo trainer. <laughs> yeah. My worry is I don't want it to increase what I do. And yeah. I think my personality. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to. Is, I'll just I mean, it probably would like to start off with, but you soon like. It's got to be. I mean, it it would increase what you do in some ways, but you've got to then find a way for it to supplement. Um, yes. Bonus your training. It can't just be used as an object to tire yourself out more. It can't take away from your running. It's got yeah. to profit your running. And then, you know, lots of people can do that. You just have to be. Um, you just have to be um, strict with it and make sure it's got its place, like everything. That's enough by chat, Eddie. What about, what about yourself? Yeah, enough about you, Gary. Uh, no, <laughs> it's going to be so dull the next 10 days. I'm so sorry, everybody. Next week, we'll fill the podcast, not with me talking about not doing much. Uh, I've got my last long run tomorrow. I'm just debating whether to do a long run with the dogs and just enjoy being out in the mountains, blah, 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 yeah. blah or to be a bit more focused and not take the dogs and do specific terrain. I'm, I'm wondering, like, a lovely run with the dogs might fill my soul a bit before yeah. the race. I probably will do that. 
just enjoy it go out and breathe relax a bit eddie take a chill it's just a freaking race nobody cares but you uh yeah so i am yeah a last long run tomorrow and then that's it really I'm just gonna try and deal with myself <laughs> my god eddie just <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not to spend too much time worrying i'm gonna watch some netflix i'm gonna we've got some research to do. we've got some exciting uh, podcast guests coming up so we need to actually sit and do some well i need to actually sit and do some perhaps i'm gonna focus on a bit of work and read a book uh, we've got to read a book um and uh just tick off the next few days and just get out i, I will this weekend sort of my kit out ready for poor Bryn. He's got 24 hours ahead of him. Are you on the avoiding people um, uh, fears at the moment? I don't want to get ill and so I want to kind of keep away well, from... Well, we do like a lot of shared lifts up okay. and down to various sporting activities. And the kids all got in the van yesterday and they were all going, eh, eh, eh. They're all full. <laughs> and I was opening the windows going, oh my God, I'm going to have to start offering masks and gels. Yeah. But yeah, next week I won't see anyone. But... Can you do it's that time of year, isn't it? It's that time of year where everyone's coughing and spluttering. But Gary, I don't see anybody anyway, so it's not like uh, might limit my CAF four trips to just once next week, just in case. <laughs> and that's it. So yeah, this time next week I'm going to be quiet. We might just say hello. Here's the podcast. <laughs> We've got a few uh, bonus shows that we stick out. <laughs> stick out no one wants to talk to Eddie. She is cranky. <laughs> I think it's going to be awesome, Eddie. I'm really looking forward. I'm excited. And I do care. You know, you people don't care, but I do care. Oh, you do care. (laughs) Well, I've got to say, I really appreciate, you know, I've had a few people um, since I've been poorly reaching out, just checking in. And I do appreciate your little texts that I've had, making sure I'm okay. Has it gone annoyed? Oh, stop it. You're (laughs) blushing. (laughs) Right, let's wrap this up. We've got things to do. People have got places to do. If you want a shout out, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five star review. Come on, we've got a review with the boss next week. Let's get a couple of five star reviews on those and we can read them out to him. Otherwise, it might be cold for Christmas. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, he would also like us to say that you get a chocolate orange protein bar for every £10 spent online for the rest of the month they are so good those cheer charged chocolate orange protein bars you're looking like you've never had one no i've never had one but i do love chocolate orange oh my god they are just like these little um yeah but they're big yeah they're lovely yeah they're good with a cup of tea yeah yeah i made a fail mistake after one run i handed out some bars and my supply pretty much (gasps) (laughs) never share Never share. I thought it was good exchange, business. I thought it'd be good. Exchange. Yeah, never yeah. share. <laughs> we have we have a WhatsApp group. Me and uh, the girls that I train with, and where there's quite a lot of like, who's got a bar? Who's got a bar? So we've got one of those bars. We want to change. <laughs> Obviously, we have to get everything sent in. So I did a I did a gel. Any, who's got gels that are going to go out of date that they want me to take for this race? And I'll buy you new ones because <laughs> wow. everyone's finished racing. So I was like, might as well. So I four bags of treats coming in of all these stuff that people aren't going to use i mean he bought the morton gels but i I didn't do that they were so expensive i thought well i'm not really investing how much how much a gel are they the gel it was like i think 30 odd quid for 12 a gel yeah no it was like a box of 12 for 30 something pound oh um, honestly you know if it was my ear race i think yeah maybe i would treat myself yeah but But you um, can't train with that can you no it's quite expensive (laughs) some some people are (laughs) it's uh but yeah it's beyond my budget that was episode 64 of run to the hills thanks for listening thanks again uh to cheer charge for sponsoring the show i'm eddie sutton and i'm gary thwaites and let's run to the hills (laughs) 